अलिकति क्यामेरालाई नजिक ल्याउ आवाज है Are we waiting for anyone? So I'm I'm just back. I'm not sure what's happening with the moderator. I think there's a Wi-Fi issue. Um, let me um, suppose we just start. Um, Can we all hear each other? Hi, hi, hi Binod. It's we met at uh, what was it? Looking. What? You can't hear us. You can't. Can you hear me? Yeah. I can't hear. You can't hear. No, he can't hear. Sorry. Maybe um, uh, we can hear you. Hamro mute karne ka sir yo. I think Vinod Chaudhary has a problem with his. Uh... Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, but I can't. Sorry. Uh... Some go out and come in. Go out and come in. That's what I did. Exit and come back in. Okay. Yeah. Exit and come back in. I think maybe let's just uh, start and then um, coming in a in a second. So welcome to the closing plenary session, uh, which is on the um, Asian century post-COVID. Um, Asia is definitely good news. If you think about um, ASEP, the new trade agreement, if you think about um, Asia tackling the COVID crisis, um, Asia is the first continent getting out of um, COVID. It's not only China, but uh, the whole of Asia. Uh, and think about this new uh, economic uh, dynamism in Asia with um, Asian companies starting to reinvest and to globally re-engage. Um, so in this session, we are looking into um, the Asian century, uh, the upcoming Asian century from a corporate point of view. You're all businessmen, entrepreneurs, and uh, you deal uh, with Asia on the one hand or you're Asian and you're working from Asia. And um, my question would be, you know, how do you see the future as a um, business leader in Asia? Are you optimistic? What are your strategic plans? And uh, what do you want to do um, in the future to pivot and to, um, you know, see how the company could be even repositioned um, in the future? Let me start with uh, Vinod Seka, who's the chairman and group CEO right. of Peter Group based in Kuala Lumpur uh, in Malaysia. Uh, starting with a view from Southeast Asia. Be not. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, Frank. I, I guess we first, you're right, Asia is the first to come out. and But I, I think we can't be relaxed about it. Um, COVID is not going to go away fast and it's not you know, going to go away soon. Uh, we're going to have to deal with COVID as, as, uh, as something we just have to live with. Uh, perhaps in a more controlled situation and something that we can get around. But we have to be alert. Having said that, Asia is different from most other parts of the world. I mean, our socioeconomic situation, our democratic situation, they are 
they are diverse and they are different. Uh, some might call many countries in, in Southeast Asia and it's, uh, not democratic or slightly democratic or, or authoritarian. Um, also, the poverty levels are different. Our economic uh, levels in each country is different. So our challenges are very different. What, what this situation has created, the opportunities created for us, is to, to, to look at how economic leaders reposition themselves to be socioeconomic leaders as well. I think businessmen now have to be involved with how the socioeconomic impact of their businesses have on the society they're, they're working in. And, and that's both the opportunity and the challenge for us. We're going to come out first. And I think when the markets start opening, it's going to be, you know, it, it, it'll, be, it'll be opening on steroids. Everyone will be rushing forward and we'll be opening very, very aggressively. Uh, okay. And it's how we deal with that situation, both environmentally, socioeconomically, and every other way uh, going forward. We've been given an opportunity to re reboot uh, and re-gear ourselves in, in how we approach things. And that's an opportunity we should take advantage of. Absolutely. And this is, you know, it's an opportunity and um, we have to grasp opportunity. I think in each crisis, uh, there are chances and uh, ways to get strong out of it and to increase our competitiveness. Uh, let me call on uh, Mino Chaudhry, who is uh, from Kathmandu. Um, Mino Chaudhry is leading the largest uh, conglomerate uh, in the country with uh, investments all over Asia and World. Uh, and Nepal was also doing a, a very uh, admirable job in the COVID crisis. Uh, what is your view, Binot, on of the Asian century with Nepal uh, at the core and how do we see the future? Well, thank you, uh, Frank, uh, for this opportunity. Sorry about this uh, technical hiccup. I hope that everybody can hear me now. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Um, so great pleasure to be back on a Horace's uh, forum once again. And uh, I wish to present my compliments to all of you and uh, to the organizers. You know, when we talk of uh, Asia, I mean, you know, there is no one single Asia. I mean, there are, I mean, you know, there is no question if we talk on at a larger level, we can say that there was a clearly a shift of the economic uh, sort of uh, right from consumption to production, the global GDP, so to say, and the Asia as a whole is all poised to become probably half of this world. And everybody knows that by more importantly by 2040. But same times we have an Asia where the three countries, Japan, Korea and China, you know, they represent 30 percent of the world's consumption, the 30 percent of uh, the world's uh, GDP, same times. And there are countries in the ASEAN region where like, like Singapore, for instance, where the per capita GDP is in the tune of sixty thousand dollar Singapore, whereas there are countries around South Asia, my own home turf, OK, led by India, where the per capita income ranges from anywhere from a thousand dollar, which is the case for Nepal, to probably three to four thousand dollar at the most. So there are clearly three different levels of countries or economies in the range in the in the system. But the good news is that it's a connected world. OK, we all know we all know that. Uh, Mm, uh, you know, all countries, most countries, and particularly South Asia is seriously impacted by COVID. The ec economic downturn is, has been much more serious than one would have imagined. Okay, there are signs of uh, vaccine being available the first quarter, but how long it is going to take for the mood, for the confidence level and the safety to come back is anybody's guess. And the way the businesses have been disrupted, the whole supply chain has been disrupted, how long it's going to take for the whole system to become functional is another huge issue. I don't still, I'm totally convinced that this is the century for Asia, no question about it. But I think it is the current crisis is going to delay the process or somewhat bring in some, some critical departures from the strategies which each of these countries had adopted pre 
COVID. There is on one hand, there is every reason to be optimistic that we will be back on track because this is where the consumption is. This is where the skill set lies. This is where very high level of talent exists. And there is also a, a big gap in terms of fulfillment of the demand. So the demand is will continue to grow and so will the economies. But same times, let's not forget that there are also serious tensions within some of the countries in the region, which is pulling the whole process of recovery down. I think that's something which probably uh, everybody would like to hope and wish that gets addressed okay, without delay, given the uh, urgency that the new set of urgency that the COVID has posed. But it's a it's a difficult one. You know, the China has been encircled by the by the certain countries in its own way. There is conflict within South Asia, where which is impeding the growth. And, and, and you know, there are many other countries, in, even in Asia, and where things are not that simple. However, I, I still remain very optimistic because of the digital revolution. I think it's, I think that the political differences will not be able to contain the world from becoming much more connected. It's a different story that there will be disruptions. We all know new set of industries new set of business activities and enterprises will come to the center stage. What was relevant yesterday may not be relevant tomorrow. These will change. So the hope is the new generation, new generation of businesses based on digital technology, the opportunities that still remain unexploited. However, huge amount of capital will have to be made available for many of these countries, by those countries who are in a stronger position to recover faster, to reshape, to rebuild many of these countries. It's very, very sad mm. that the pace at which most of these countries were moving. Let's take the case of India, for instance. I mean, India, you know, India has probably faced one of the biggest setback in recent history. And what happens in India impacts the entire South Asia. For that matter, the entire world. I mean, you know, we we uh, we would like to see that India recovers faster because it's also uh, it's it's also the powerhouse of the um, economic progress of the region. But same time, we would also wish that India plays a much larger role. So does China in the South Asian region. I think you're absolutely right, um, Vinod. And, uh, you know, we need um, strong Asia and, of course, strong countries like India and China and uh, eventually working together. Uh, because, you know, despite all the optimism we see in Asia, now with ASEP, the new trade agreement, there are also a lot of differences and even like, you know, opponent, opponent views. Uh, and not only between China and India, but also between China and Japan and Korea within Southeast Asia. But you said, you know, Digitalization uh, might be the hope. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Hashpari Singhania, who is uh, just joining us, who is a vice chairman and managing director of Cheeky Paper based in India. We talked about um, India before. Mm -hmm. uh, Hashpari, your company is one of the leading uh, conglomerates um, in India, mm -hmm. uh, active in many different um, areas. Um, what is your view um, on, on the future of Asia? And uh, are you optimist that, you know, India will come out of it stronger out of the COVID crisis? Uh, thank you, Frank. And first of all, uh, my, can, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry for the delayed thing. There was a technology glitch despite all of this. And uh, uh, very nice to see all the other people on the panel. And Benoji, I, I got your remarks and uh, good to see you. Um, Pleasure indeed. Yes. Uh, so, no, I, I mean, to, to be very direct, I think India will come out uh, stronger from uh, the COVID crisis. Uh, we, um, uh, there has been very quick learning, uh, as, as Mr. Chaudhary was saying, uh, because this was something which nobody in the globe had expected. And I think um, there are several aspects. And if I caught some of the things that Mr. Chaudhary also talked about, and I reiterate, 
this whole creation of um, of our sep even though india is not a part of it at this point uh, is a very big development because if you if we go back and step back for a minute and look at the last 3 decades essentially what has happened is the globe this globalization has changed because of the emergence of global supply chains driven uh, very strongly by china uh, originally of course you had japan and you had south korea and then the other dragons which were the the the, the power houses coming from the asian countries but china really changed that equation now uh with covid coming in and there being also let's be very frank everybody wants a china plus one strategy for their supply chain so other countries in the asian region will probably step in or are already stepping in to become that plus one and india will will find its place now for example our prime minister has made uh um, announced this our program uh and that scope has been expanded and we also have the pli program which is uh, for production linked incentives for for manufacturing in india but with a global market in mind and that scope has been expanded so india clearly is putting in place these policies one thing i'd like to say however is that globalization the way we had seen before will perhaps undergo <clears throat> a change in model and what we saw in the first experience of globalization mm-hmm. in the last two decades was that we had you know great benefit from cheaper goods and services however this also led to greater inequality between nations between people and one of the social issues globally is not just asia but even in the west is the rising inequality between the between the rich and the so called not rich and therefore now this new model of globalization which i think will be led by asia will have to balance the country interests along with global interests so therefore this whole issue or this degree of protectionism uh, people will have to realize that they will have to allow people uh, in countries to have a level playing field and uh, i think that is what india has also been um, trying to do and uh, and that for so i i, I will uh, sort of pause here um, at this point in time there are many many other points but i'll pause here very good point um, ashpari i think you know redefining globalization which is not just trade it's not just uh, investment i think we clearly missed all the social dimension in the past and um, not only between countries but also within countries as we see a lot of um, uh, inequalities um, and we see a lot of disparities um, what is um, the strategy to come over that and maybe even to redefine capitalism and let me ask um, you be not uh, for you from uh, malaysia uh, as uh, malaysia is always seen as you know the, the the big country in between right between india between china um, and uh, you know your strengths in in both sides um, and um, you know uh, being in a way the kind of epicenter of globalization for seeing what's happening in penang with all the manufacturing starting already 30 40 years ago so uh, your malaysia is is a good symbol of globalization but how do we have to redefine it you're muted yeah you're on mute yes yeah sorry about that okay <laughs> can you hear me now yes good all right uh malaysia is unique in the sense that yeah you're right i mean we're multiracial multicultural multilingual uh multireligious um but like all other countries we have our problems uh, we're having our problems now uh, only made better by the fact that we look at america and we feel a bit better because they're going through a bit worse than we are but um um we are in a unique position because you're right we we're, we're right at the, at the center of, of of trade between china and india and historically we've been that center we've we've brought brought these two countries together and we've we've represented both sides uh in in global trade uh with our organizations and our manufacturing facilities um the challenge now for us is to move past our plantation based industries um like all countries we run out of land you run out of land land prices goes up labor becomes short uh how do you carry on with palm oil how do you carry on with rubber 
and out, etc. We've we've shifted now aggressively originally to, to electronics. Uh, that's been hurt because you know we're competing with Vietnam and other places as we move forward. Now, right now, we're one of these we're one of these positions where we have to actively go out and become the trading center for these major um, manufacturers and major traders and major major economies like China and India, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we're opening up to India. We're we're welcoming India. We're trying to build a relationship with India as we move forward. Um, and with China, it's you know it hit a pause button for a bit uh, under the previous Najib government. Uh, well, straight after the Najib government because of uh, many issues, and now we're re-engaging uh, from infrastructure development to everything else. The challenge we face is to balance these sides out. We can't be like many African countries, which has been overcome by one country uh, in terms of investment and direction. And we, as a small country of 32 million people, um, as a trading nation, we have to be have to be careful and balance things out. That's why it's important for us to start with ASEAN and to be, make ASEAN a stronger trading uh, block to ensure that we work together within ASEAN and from there go out. Because within ASEAN, if we can work together, we become quite significant and strong uh, to then... Uh, do the kind of deals we need to with the EC, with China, with uh, South Asia, etc. Right. I think, you know, starting small and then, uh, you know, growing with time, adding more countries to the trade block. Uh, maybe it's a question to um, you, uh, Binot, and to you, Hashpadi. Uh, do you see an immediate future of um, uh, ASEP? Uh, uh, plus India plus Nepal, and, and and if so, what is your time horizon? So, when is when is India, when is Nepal going to join finally, if at all? Oh, well, <laughs> and that's an interesting one. I think uh, we are a very small player in that respect as a country, but uh, we are uh, certainly proud of what we do, and then we uh, uh, are, I think, totally aligned. Uh, with India to lead the destinies of South Asia, make South Asia or some other structures. You know, if there are problems which are not going to be surmountable, probably we have to move on and we have to create, uh, you know, whether it is uh, the shark without a particular country or two, we have to come together and India has to prove, play that leading role. I know that India is under serious uh, trouble, uh, India's economy and India, given the social, socio, uh, political environment. I think I have a thing, although there is a great leadership in India, both uh, on the political as well as on the business side. I find that my colleagues, my friends, including my friend, Mr. Singhania, who is here representing India, are doing their best and really reason to the occasion, you know. But still, I mean, you know, these are not uh, small problems to handle. So I would again uh, say that there will, there will have to be a mechanism to sort of address what are these opportunities which just post-COVID to bring these economies, the weaker economies together, weaker economies together by the stronger economies who still have that clout, who still have that the pool of resources to pull them up. You know, let me give you an example. The biggest uh, problem, in my opinion, that all most of our countries, particularly in South Asia, we are facing, that the governments have, are trying to push the production side, supply side, by providing stimulus, okay, which is fine to the banks, to the industry, to everyone. Probably that's also the case in many other Asian countries. But what about the demand side? Our problem is demand. Demand is declining. There is no money. There are There is a huge unemployment issue. People in the informal sector cannot survive. They find it difficult to live for today. Forget about, and we are here discussing the century. And if this problem is not addressed, we are talking about a serious social conflict. These countries, don't forget that Asia, on one hand, has 60 some the 60% of the global population, but same times we also have 30% of the world's poorest 
in this region. There are also people who survive on one dollar a day. And these are the people who are hurt the most. So this is the kind of a challenge with which Asia is posed with. Some are stronger economies at the end of the day, but the markets are these. So everybody need to realize, everybody will have to realize that, you know, if the market sinks, if the markets tank, if the ability to purchase tanks, uh, can you hear me? I, I lost. Uh, yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Gallery. You can hear me, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. So I won't be too long. So, so my point is that every country, particularly the bigger countries, the bigger countries of the region, Japan, China, and India, will have to recognize that unless, unless we provide adequate resources to the smaller countries in Asia, which are hurt the most, their markets are going to tank. As it is, as it is, there is a pressure from the West. Okay. Unfortunately, I hope that changes. There is a there is a desire to sort of go against the established norms of opening up the market. I think U.S. during the Trump regime did their best to create uh, tariff and non-tariff walls vis-a-vis -vis the other Asian countries, particularly China. So I think I guess. I think all these issues will require serious attention and the leadership has to come from countries which can make a difference. Thank you. Very good point, um, Vinod. And, uh, you know, the, the large and the small countries, uh, we in the West, if I say, you know, we, I mean, Europe and America, we, we often don't know about the complexity and, and the history of Asia. For us, it's only one block, but there are so many differences. Mm -hmm between small and big and different cultures and uh, religion. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a microcosmos. Uh, but you mentioned already mm -hmm. um, India and Nepal eventually, you know, going together. And, of course, you're already going together, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's uh, like a strong partnership. Um, so I'm asking you, Hashpadi, what is your view on uh, India and, and ASEP in the future? Or maybe India and TDP. And we should maybe talk about... Um, US uh, uh, in the next round of questions as well. Of course, we have a new incoming mm -hmm. president who might change directions. Uh, so what is your view on, on trade and, and Asian unity? So I, I think, um, you know, India's stated position on RCEP is that it is not against joining RCEP. You, as you know, our Commerce Minister had worked very hard Uh, in the earlier rounds of RCEP negotiations to try and see that India can be a part of this. However, India uh, is quite clear that it wishes to join if, the, if uh, it is an equal partnership and if, in, in India's perspective, it offers a fair trade to India. So India is not close to the idea, but let, let me put it this way, that as we see now at the current moment, India will watch how RCEP will develop. And this is my personal view, so I'm not offering a, a government or a political view. Um, I, I think India will watch how RCEP shapes up, how what kind of structures are put into place so that no single country or, or, or no, uh, you know, two or three countries become dominant. And if it is seen, because as, as Mr. Binod Chaudhary was making a very valid point that, uh, you know, we need to have a rising tide, but a tide that will lift all boats and not just some. And therefore, the, within Asia, there is a very big disparity. Now, while we talk of the positive points of Asia and say that, you know, the home to three of the five biggest economies, 40%, of the world GDP by people, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We also realize that there are huge economic differences between different Asian and Asia Pacific, if I may include Australia Asia into this whole equation, uh, countries. And therefore, uh, how RCEP's principles are put together, how it actually works out, will be keenly watched by India. And again, as I said, if we believe that we can be a partner who can bring more value, I don't think as a country we will back out. So that would be my understanding as far as we are concerned on, on our set. Now, coming to India's situation and the Asian, one, I think clearly we are going to see greater 
inter uh, or intra asian region trade and in in goods and services now i emphasize services as well and investment also because technology today has made location redundant so really a lot of global trade will happen through technology and therefore services comes into the fore and so therefore we'll see much greater trade uh, uh, in in this as mr shekhar i think was also mentioning you know the example of malaysia being there etc so uh, we will see this secondly i think from a market standpoint there's don't no denying that asia constitutes a huge market so if i may nuance it to the next question you were asking in terms of the united states or or otherwise the globe will still see um asia as a very large market now india has been a bit unique amongst many other the asian countries because india has grown not from an export strategy like the initial um you know growth of japan korea china singapore hong kong and some others india has grown more from the larger domestic market like the united states has as compared to europe so while the new policies of the government are looking to promote exports with a domestic base we can engage very productively with the developed countries on the one hand and also from uh, the asian region um, growth of supply chain and trade that's what i feel yeah you know uh, uh, very good point we have to look into the supply chains and the value chains of course beyond the grand political concepts uh, businessmen have to do business and to, to see you know where to put the supply chains um, it could be in an asep country it could be in europe um, it could be in the us uh, i think globalization at its best and you just uh, take your uh, make your decision uh, you mentioned already the us and maybe uh that's uh, the question you know i'm burning to ask you uh, what what do you think you know um the new administration's um impact on asia will be is uh, going to be a sea change from uh, the trump years or will um, biden just continue maybe with a different rhetoric but uh, in principle the same line of argument um winner would you like to to start and be be go around i will actually leave in 2 minutes uh because i have to go to the next panel uh, but maybe we not you can um uh um arrange the discussion uh, on on this topic well I'll, i'll just before i go into america let me just say something about what mr singhania and mr chaudhary is talk, talking about the rising tide lifting everyone i think we have to accept one thing we have to temper greed among us businessmen right there will be no rising tide lifting everyone if we continue to operate the way we've always operated okay the disparity in india or nepal or malaysia is acute and is getting worse so that will not change unless we as economic leaders decide to change it unless we ensure that we as businessmen change the way we operate the way we look at our businesses and the way we look at profit where profit is beyond just the cash we make but how we enhance the community we are living in how we enhance the workers that work with us and things like that so just to go back just to touch on that i think that's something that we have to do otherwise we're talking and talking and talking and we will change nothing so leaders like us leaders like yourselves you're the key we have be we have to be the ones that actually show the way of how things have to operate and from that perhaps everyone else rises with us and then everyone below them rises uh but that's an important point and i just wanted to touch on that before i start on the us uh the us yeah. well um okay we can't ignore the us obviously right i'd like to but we can't um donald trump has uh, has uh, certainly caused certain uh, uh irritations for for many of us um but i believe looking at uh at can you guys hear me am i am i coming through i keep seeing different okay um i think biden will be more of a more of a open handed and willing partner than trump ever was trump was uh illogical in his in his approach to the rest of the world uh because he was feeding to oh, his own base in america that required a certain rhetoric uh and the thing about trump is he only used rhetoric that worked for him and it that's the only way he would do it as long as he he, he got the support biden i think will be more 
open-armed, and I think he'll be logical in the way he approaches the rest of the world. And I think potentially um, he could he could be a great partner for the greater Asian uh, economies because I think they need us. America might like to think they can live in a bubble, but they can't. Um, you know, in the long term, they will die without partnership with Asia, without partnership with India, Nepal, China, ASEAN. Uh, it is it is for their survival. They need to create the partnership for the long term. And for us, we are the future. But to get there, we need to have the relationship with America. So it's it's, it's a sort of a, a, a chicken and egg of how we approach this. But that's the reality of what we're dealing with. I, I Hi, uh, this is uh, this is Joji Tangawa. I was not giving a chance to uh, talk about it. So so let me briefly say two things. One, I would welcome uh, India for for our SEP because this is uh, this is great opportunity for for Japan and for the auto industry. Second, for the um, uh, Trump administration, of course, uh, this is one of uh, huge uh, uh, impact to automotive industry. And uh, to me, the change from uh, Trump to Biden, I think uh, it's uh, equally challenging for the automotive industry. Of course, Trump administration is uh, like unpredictable. So, so that is a big threat for the automotive industry who needs to make a significant investment in many years in advance. But on the other hand, Biden has more, uh, uh, you know, as, as, as a Democrat, uh, this is more like a unionized, a little more, uh, uh, not, not as friendly as uh, Trump for the industry, particularly for the car manufacturing standpoint. So those are the two remarks before, uh, before I'm losing uh, to say a hi to all of you. Okay, I think our, our I think Robert Shafer, you've just arrived. You haven't had a chance to say anything either. Do you want to? I think it's time is running out. So, oh no, he's disappeared. As well. So, in fact, I had uh, it says I, on this. Ah. Yeah, I, I had technical problems. Now, in fact, I, uh, I I lost you all in the debate. Therefore, I I, I wasn't even aware. In fact, what you were discussing about. Uh, so th th this We're is actually now talking about in America now, the U.S. and the relationship with uh, uh, Asia, and whether Biden yeah, right. would change the the, the prospect uh, as uh, after Trump. Well, if we put it in a nutshell, in fact, we all cross fingers that. Oops. Will be in fact we we will need to see, but what is very clear to me, and uh, uh, this applies in fact also to my view on. Uh, how Asia, in fact, can develop uh, uh, going forward. And a lot of things have been said about the diversity of the various economies, the interlinkage, and so on. But in fact, the, the Americas, uh, uh, the US, and with America first, is a, is, is, is a slogan, in fact, which, of course, uh, America lives it every day. Basically, for all big economic uh, uh, areas like the EU at the same time. So, in fact, at the end of the day, what uh, what we need, whether it applies to Asia for its uh, rapid economic development, it will need partners. Uh, we all need partners, but Asia, in fact, will need um, uh, just two things which I want to say is uh, they will need to have access to capital, and the development, uh, the economic development needs. Because of other uh, countries um, who have developed very quickly at the expense of the environment and ultimately of the population and the uh, and, and and the citizens, uh, development needs to be done on a sustainable basis, and that's where I, as a financier, as an exchange uh, CEO can tell you that um, we see uh, we are running, in fact, the only green exchange in the world, and uh, it, and it has 50% worth. Hey. Amount of capital available for projects and companies that show, in fact, that they really mean it, not only for the short-term profit, but that they are... Uh, And while limiting the impact on environment and therefore giving a future 
uh, to future uh, generations. That's basically um, Have we lost our moderator? I think so. I think uh, let, let's just let's just round this up because I think it's time's gone out. So <laughs> maybe um, Ms. Ngani and Ms. Jadri, you want to just uh, say a few words, and then Mr. Shafa, and we can just round this, close this session right. up. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, you know that I think I'll be very brief. I think we talked about, uh, or some of you talked about reshap, and my view is that. Uh, you know, it's good for the big economies of the Asia to come together. There have been attempts in the past in one way or other. But I think these, you know, together is a huge part.